Now let us join together in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this morning that you've given us to gather once again as your people, to hear your word, to receive you in fullness in the Lord's Supper. Father, I pray that these things strengthen us in faith, to have faith even in those times when it be most difficult for us. Lord, give us renewed eyes to see you in every area of our lives. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Cruel is not a word we tend to associate with Jesus. Every Sunday during worship, we invoke the name of Jesus Christ as someone who is merciful, loving, forgiving, is there to hear our deepest prayers. But nowhere in any service in our entire green book do we use the word cruel to describe our Lord Jesus. And yet, there's no denying in our gospel reading this morning that Jesus appears to come across as exactly this, cruel, uncaring, and inattentive to someone's cries for help. So why does Jesus respond this way to this woman? Why does Jesus act in the complete opposite way we would expect him to as our merciful Lord and Savior? Well, to answer that question, I believe the key to understanding this story is to read it from a deeply Old Testament perspective. Remember, Matthew is writing to a Christian, but primarily Jewish Christian audience. And he assumes most of his readers know their Old Testaments really, really well. So in reading the story this way, we gain important insights into what Jesus is doing exactly this morning. Our story begins, and Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. This is one of those rare occasions where Jesus actually leaves Israel during his ministry. And when we hear about the region of Tyre and Sidon in the Bible, we might as well hear the phrase pagan land. Tyre and Sidon were Phoenician cities just north of Israel, and throughout the Old Testament, they continually tempt the Israelites to worship their false gods. For instance, the evil queen Jezebel, who reintroduced Baal worship to Israel, was from this exact region. All this to say Jewish people in the time of Jesus did not think highly of Tyre and Sidon. It was a region of Gentiles who worshipped false idols and had a history of being antagonists against Israel and leading them astray. So why would Jesus travel there? Some believe Jesus didn't really have a choice. By this time, the Pharisees were after Jesus, and if he went south, east, or west, it might have put his ministry in danger. Yet I believe Jesus traveled there to teach his disciples a lesson in faith. While the Jewish scribes and Pharisees denied God by rejecting Christ, how do people of this forbidden pagan land respond to Christ? And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out. A Canaanite would have been an inhabitant or someone from this region. And again, if we're reading the story with an Old Testament view, we know the Canaanites are often scripted as the villains of the Old Testament. Israel was repeatedly at war with the Canaanites, and the Canaanites were responsible for introducing all sorts of wicked practices into Israel, the worst of which by far was child sacrifice. And to show you just how famous the Canaanites were for being evil, take this modern example. When we refer to a traitor, we like to use the phrase Benedict Arnold. Because as far as we're concerned, Benedict Arnold was the worst traitor in American history. Well, for Israel at this time, it was common to use the word Canaanite in a similar way, to refer to someone who is especially wicked or evil. Again, all this to say this woman isn't just a Gentile. She isn't just a pagan. 
But from Israel's point of view, she is a member of the worst Gentile pagans you could possibly be. And yet, in this pagan land, we meet a historic enemy of Israel, and what does she do? She cries, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. This is the kind of response Jesus wanted Israel to give him when he came. The kind of response the Pharisees and the scribes were supposed to give. But instead, it's this Canaanite woman, despised by Israel, who calls Jesus exactly who he is, Lord and Son of David, the Messiah. But how does Jesus respond to this surprising confession of faith? It says he did not answer her a word. The word made flesh doesn't say a word to this woman. Why? Is she not sincere enough? Is she somehow unfit to be in his presence? But two things to notice so far. First, Jesus never sends her away. Even though he answers her with silence, Jesus never scoffs or rejects her prayer outright. Second, remember, we're reading this story from an Old Testament perspective. And when we read the Psalms in particular, we start to notice that many of the prayers concern frustration with God's silence. In Psalm 13, we read this. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul? In other words, God, how long are you going to leave me alone with my soul? Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my graining? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. Psalm 28. My rock, be not deaf to me, lest you be silent to me. I become like those who go down into the pit. Psalm 83. O oh God, do not Keep silent. Do not hold your peace or be still. What I love about the Psalms is that they never shy away from real human emotions that we often feel toward God at different times. Sadness, anger, frustration, disappointment. The Psalm writers never try to cover up how they really feel about God by buttering him up with flowery language but they're brutally honest. God, I feel forsaken by you. God, why aren't you answering me? God, why are you silent? Jesus' disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. Now to clarify here, what the disciples aren't saying is just send her away from us. But more specifically, the Greek implies that they're saying, Jesus, give her what she wants, so then you can send her away from us. So while the disciples are clearly annoyed at her presence, they are at least trying to get Jesus to do what she's asking. But listen to how Jesus responds. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now notice Jesus is responding to the disciples. So even in this response, he's still ignoring this woman. So not only is the woman greeted with silence from the Lord, but now he answers others and not her. Are we starting to see ourselves in this Canaanite woman? Have we found ourselves seeing answered prayers all around us except our own? So what does she do in response? Does she give up? Does she go home? No. But it says she knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. She throws herself at the feet of the only one who can save her daughter and prays for help. 
But he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. As if Jesus couldn't come across as less caring and more cold, he turns to this woman and calls her a dog. Now, some preachers will try to soften this by saying, well, Jesus uses the word for domesticated house dog, not the word for mangy junkyard dog. But for me personally, calling a woman a dog is calling a woman a dog. Whether it's a Westminster show dog or a mangy stray, it's an undignified insult. And yet, there is something important about Jesus calling her a house dog. Because listen to the woman's reply. Yes, lo- you'll, yes Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Now notice what the woman does. She hears the word of Jesus. And despite how painful and despite how undignified it is, She clings to it and uses it to turn the tables back on Jesus. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in a strange way, this Canaanite woman does something similar to Moses way back in the book of Exodus. Remember the golden calf story. Moses comes down the mountain and he sees Israel worshiping a golden calf as God. Well, in response, God tells Moses, Moses, my anger burns hot against Israel and I'm going to destroy them for what they did. But listen to how Moses responds. He says, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And then it says, the Lord relented from his disaster. When God said, I'm going to destroy Israel, Moses said, whoa, hold on a minute, God. That's not who you promised to be. You said we would be a great nation. You said you would bring us to the promised land. So God, be faithful to what you have said. Is Moses being disrespectful? No. But he's praying the way we ought to pray. The way this Canaanite woman prays. By holding God to his spoken word. When Jesus calls the Canaanite woman a house dog, she says, Lord, if you say I'm a house dog, then give me what house dogs are entitled to. Lord, if you say I'm a house dog, that means I'm in the Lord's house. And those crumbs that fall from the table are mine. So Lord, be faithful to what you've said. In the words of Martin Luther, Jesus has been caught in his own words, which is exactly what he wanted all along. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. There's a small detail that I believe Matthew left here for us on purpose. Notice in our gospel reading how Jesus is never mentioned by name while he's ignoring and dodging this woman's prayers. It only says he. He didn't answer her a word. The disciples begged him. He said, and and so on. But here, right in this verse, Matthew finally says, Jesus answered her. As if by her persistent faith, the fullness of Jesus Christ is finally revealed to this woman. And see how Jesus calls her woman. Not a dog, but a woman. And finally, he gives her more than just crumbs. But he answers her prayer as a child of the Lord's house. The faith of this Canaanite woman is the faith that all of us are called to. Faith that clings to Christ in the face of God's apparent no. 
faith that holds to the gospel's mercy in the face of the law's judgment. We can sit here and accuse Jesus for being cruel, for calling this woman a dog. But what does God's word call us? Sinners? Transgressors? Wicked? Murderers? Adulterers? Those are much worse than being called a dog. But what else does God's word say? That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let us have the bold faith of this Canaanite woman to say, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. But if you say I'm a sinner, then give me what you promise, sinners. Lord, if I'm a sinner, then Christ died for me and he cleanses me of all unrighteousness. So God, be faithful to what you have said. When we have this faith that clings to God's word, then it is done to us according to exactly what it says. We are forgiven, we're cleansed. The fullness of Christ is revealed to us, and we are welcomed as a child at the table of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.